company. There is no rum here. <laughs> not happening. I know you probably were hoping there was like a hidden mojito somewhere. That's not the case. But um, there's some really great, interesting information about our campus here. So the tower, which is uh, directly outside of this space, which we call the Jewel Box, was designed in 1963 by Cuban architect Enrique Gutierrez. And it features a mural by a Brazilian artist, Francisco Bernan, with more than 28,000 hand-painted and fired tiles. The Jewel Box, the space that you're currently in, was designed in 1974 by Ignacio Cabrera Justiz, who is an artist, who, uh, who's an architect from Coral Gables, Florida. The, the glass tapestry you see around the perimeter of the building was designed in France and is based on an abstract painting by a German artist, Johannes Dietz, and that describes the rum production process. Uh, I know, really cool. The, the, the structure that you're in right now is a really quality example of a modern cantilevered structure, and we are raised 47 feet above the ground on a pedestal. And there's actually uh, the plaza outside, which is between the jewel box and the tower. It does feature the Bacardi bat. So as you're walking across the, the plaza, make sure you take a look at the tiles on your feet or beneath your feet to see the wonderful illustration of that emblematic and iconic bat. I just feel really comfortable in this space and wanted to share also that um, the National Young Arts Foundation is an actual competition for those of you who don't know and are not aware. Um, and I am also an alumni uh, in theater, uh, class of 2000. So um, I feel really, really comfortable in this space and we're really excited for this partnership. Um, our current alumni exhibition on campus, which is on view in the gallery, was curated by acclaimed director, photographer, and who happens to be our very own Vice President of Artistic Programs, Lisa Leone. Um, and the exhibition is titled, Can We Be As Brave? The exhibition features the works of 13 Young Arts alumni, and we'd like you to view the exhi exhibition really at your opportunity, perhaps in, uh, in a space where you're taking lunch, um, and have an opportunity to see that, okay? Uh, and this Friday, Emmy Award-winning composer, pianist, singer, and music director Lance Horn, a 1996 winner in classical music, will present Re Revelations, a new musical which is based on an unpublished work by Anne Rice. Information about this performance is available on our website, which is youngarts.org. Please uh, take a look at that. Um, today is really a momentous day because we celebrate the launch of the application of our 2020 Young Arts National Competition. Our, yeah, this is a big, yeah, give that a round of applause. It's a really big, it's a really big deal because it's a great opportunity for the next generation of artists. I'm gonna tell you about that. So our performing arts disciplines in the, con in the competition include theater, and we are now accepting applications through October 11 from emerging artists ages 15 to 18 or in grades 10 through 12. Our, among our notable Young Arts Theater alumni are Timothy Chalamet from Call Me By Your Name, Viola Davis. I could list everything, but then we'd be here till 3 p.m. <laughs> Josh Groban, Terrell Alvin McCraney from of Moonlight. Yes, 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 yes. Billy Porter. Okay and Kerry Washington. So we have provided information and materials for you to share with your colleagues or the young people that you know who would really benefit from the opportunity to compete in a very creative way. And please review those at your leisure. So lastly, we welcome you to be inspired by your time here in Miami. Also, keep a handkerchief around because you might, <laughs> sweat beads might be forming as you walk from one space to the other. Just get ready for it, it's great. This year's uh, TCG conference challenges you to consider the value and necessity of adaptability. It asks you to think about Miami's plurality of global cultures and the history of reinvention. And it focuses on programmatic ideas such as audience and community engagement. Your work, you work to contribute to an inclusive and thriving theater and arts community. We are excited to partner and to partner and work together for this arts community in support of the next generation of artists to foster their creative and professional development and to support them on their path to becoming the artists that they want to be. Once again, welcome to Miami and enjoy your time here on Young Arts Campus. Right, and then just one last bit too. Miriam and I will be at the block party tonight. Yeah, 
bring a handkerchief. That might be a sweating happening there too. Uh, so that's a great opportunity for us to convene. If you have any questions about our national competition, please feel free to like maybe make some notes. We'll be at the, the party tonight and we can chat more about our work with education and the competition. All right, have a good conference. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning, welcome to Miami. Um, thank you, Marion and Evan, for your hospitality. This place is gorgeous. Uh, my name is Adrian Badu. I'm TCG's Deputy Director and Chief Operating Officer. To those of you here in the room at the National Arts Young Arts Foundation in Miami, and to those of you watching this session via the live stream presented in partnership with Howl HowlRound, welcome to TCG's Education Conference. That said, if you're speaking today, please remember to speak directly into the microphone or it will not get recorded. And we do need to share this incredible day with the folks outside of this space. I'd like to take a special moment to thank Lori Baskin, TCG's Director of Policy, Research, and Collective Action for her leadership. Woo! And to the entire National Planning Committee, many members are here today. Please stand or signal as you're able to so we may recognize and thank you. Today we will focus on three main areas of work, inclusion and empowerment of youth voices, trauma-informed care, and safety of youth in our theaters. These tracks are an extension of the great work from last year's education conference in St. Louis. We hope these conversations today contribute to creating a brave, welcoming, inclusive space for all students in our theaters. To kick off our day, we're going to hear from the incredible Evelyn Francis, uh, producing co-executive director at Theater Offensive in Boston. Evelyn is an innovative theater artist, award-winning educator, and established arts administrator. Evelyn's master's in the theater education from Emerson College culminated in a thesis which examined the effects of devised work in the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth from the theater offensive True Colors Out Youth Theater program. Um, as a result of her work with the program, True Colors was designated the 2008 Social Innovator for Empowering Youth Through the Arts by the Social Innovation Forum. In 2016, Evelyn traveled to the White House to receive the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award from First Lady Michelle Obama on behalf of True Colors. Uh. <laughs> In 2013 and 2014, Evelyn served as the lead researcher for the theater offensive on a project studying the effects of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer specific youth theater programming as an intervention for low self-esteem and depression in LGBTQ youth. So I've had the pleasure to work with Evelyn at the Theater Offensive many years ago. And to go off script a little bit, which is how our relationship is, usually is, you know, you know, I just read Evelyn's bio, but at the end of the day, Evelyn's just a badass woman leader, and I'm so excited that you're here. And not only do you advocate for queer youth, but you inspire so many adults. I know your work at the Theater Offensive has inspired me, and uh, just, it's pretty incredible. So I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so happy that I get the privilege of introducing you. So, Evelyn Francis. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, <clears throat> now I gotta live up to that intro. <laughs> we'll see how I do. So uh, I'm here today to talk about the theater health study. And um, I'm so excited that the education pre-conference is focusing on uh, youth voice and safety and trauma-informed care. Um, and I will say just to, I tend to go off script as well as Adrian just did. I go off script, so I have written everything down so I stick within time according to what Laurie has said, me, said to me. So um, I'm going to talk about the collaboration that Adrian mentioned. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Theater Offensive and the Children's uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And my collaborator on the project, um, Gerald Calzo, um, unfortunately he couldn't be here today. 
um, but he's an associate professor at uh, San Diego State University now, but our collaboration started when he was at Boston Children's Hospital. And he was kind enough to participate by contributing some video. So hold on to your hats. We got researchers talking on video a little bit later. So I know it's an exciting morning, everybody. So um, uh, let's, let's go to the first thing. So Gerald is so good because he says, whenever you do a presentation, Evelyn, you really want to have the takeaways at the beginning and the end. That way, if anybody walks out in the middle, they at least know what they're walking out on. Um, so the first, these are the takeaways from my presentation this morning. So first off, um, developing an evaluation and assessment plan is iterative. Uh, let program improvement guide you, not the funders. Let the program improvement guide you, not the funders. Community-based participatory research, or CBPR, helps programs maintain their values while engaging in research study studies. And uh, be specific when engaging in research. Be specific about the question you want to answer. Design justice, I can't emphasize this enough. Youth should be part of the framing of research or any program that you are doing. Um, theater can improve self-esteem and, and keep depression from deepening. And then finally, research data is part of a bigger picture. So let research inform your program, but not dictate it. So a little bit about the theater offensive for folks who don't know us. So our, this is our mission. We have a new mission coming out in July, along with my uh, new title, uh, producing co-executive director. I am right now the interim artistic director, but there's lots of changing changes afoot at the theater offensive. So our mission, as of today, uh, is to present the diverse realities of LGBTQ lives through art so bold, it breaks through personal isolation, challenges the status quo, and helps bring sorry, build thriving communities. So we were founded in Boston. I keep flashing, I don't know why. She just wants to make a show of it, okay. Uh, so founded in Boston in um, uh, 1989 as a guerrilla street theater troupe by our founder Abe Ryback during the early AIDS crisis. And this is a photo of our amazing staff at a pride march in Boston. So, this is a complex thing here. We have a complex grouping of programs in our organization. And so I've included this chart to help you understand a little bit the structure of our organization before we start. So our overall programming approach is called Out in Your Neighborhood. So that's the whole chart, Out in Your Neighborhood. And our programming includes the Outhood series. Oh, she's flashing again. Hold on, come on girl, there you go. Um, the residency program and the residency program, which are not age specific programs. And then True Colors Out Youth Theater, which works with youth ages 14 to 29, th nine, through four program components, including two touring ensembles for beginner and advanced participants, and a peer elected advisory committee, and also a series of free workshops and trainings that are held throughout the year. So I'll be referring to materials uh, mostly uh, about the troupe here on the bottom left. <laughs> Girl, maybe is our tech help somewhere that we can maybe get that straightened out. I don't know what's going on. My te the tech has left the building, so we're just going to have to deal with it. So uh, the True Colors is the longest running program in our organization, and it's also the longest running um, program for LGBTQ youth in the country. Maybe the world, we're not sure. We haven't confirmed that, but maybe the world. So overall, we work with about 75 to 100 youth each year. And the True Colors Troop is for youth ages 14 to 22 and has roughly 50 youth over the course of the year with about uh, 15 to 20 youth each session. And it's important to note that this is the structure of our now $1.5 million organization, but I began working at the Theater Offensive in 2001 when we were just $200,000. So some of you scaling up or down, I feel your pain. Uh, <laughs> whether it be growing pains or shrinking pains, whatever that might be. So um, I always, uh, when starting to have a conversation about True Colors, start with the youth and our community being able to speak for themselves. I feel like that's a really critical part of my work, is to make sure that youth voices are heard in every uh, 
place that I'm speaking. And so um, I'm going to have to get out of this here, low tech, low tech, and we're going to go over to here. And um, we're going to have the youth speak for themselves. Nope. Somehow I knew this was going to happen. Yep. We got nothing. I knew this was going to happen, Laurie. I knew it. I just knew it. Mm -mm. No sound. As my wife says, plug it to unplug it and plug it back in. <laughs> See if that works. No. Oh, we have it. My wife is always and right. Colors, Remember that. When you meet a person and stuff like that, that you feel like you knew them for like a year. A lifetime. Yeah, like a lifetime. True Colors is a theater troupe that serves kids from 14 to 22 in the LGBTQ community. And it's more than just about acting, it's about really spreading awareness of issues in the queer community. Hi, sweetheart, how was your day? It was fine. Just fine? Yes, fine. I'm Armenian, and my family is very conservative. What are you doing? When my father discovered I was gay, he said in a very soft, monotone voice, be normal. Two words could just kill you. <laughs> Why do you always talk to my family? He doesn't know about us. He doesn't know about us. It's your man. I'm a man. We're not supposed to be together. Before I came to True Colors, I really tried to be discreet with my sexuality. I didn't like to speak up as much. OK, no. Pick up my book. Pick up my book. With True Colors, I saw how people were comfortable in their own skin and it influenced me to get out of my shell, just to, you know, be myself. When we go to True Colors, labels are gone. They're gone. They're just taken away, and you're just you. Tejana says she's never been more real. She's never found a place where she can be as honest as she's been able to be with herself. As chaotic as the world can be, as chaotic as a life for GLBTQ youth can be, she feels like this is a place where she can rest. Honey. You are you, and there is no change in that. I love you, and God loves you. I just think they're groundbreaking. This is a space where youth can put their words out into the world. I don't care what anyone has to say. I am a gay black male who loves God, and God loves this gay black male. <laughs> I mean, I felt so many different things. Like, I felt like crying, I felt like smiling, I felt like just screaming amen. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was really good. They were just, like, <laughs> honest and, like, open about everything, and it was, like, cool to hear that. If something needs to be said, this needed to be said to open the eye to the acceptance of everybody. There were definitely some kids who I think were, like, really kind of, like, oh, my gosh, those two boys just kissed. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, my gosh, those two girls just kissed. But by the end of it, oh, yep, two boys just kissed. No big deal, you know? Like, I feel like it would be great for all kids to see that. Brent, look. See? I told you you could pull this look off. Kind of look like a bro. Sweet. <laughs> it touched me personally, being a trans man. Just to have that on stage, I was crying, actually, in the audience because it just touched me so much. I don't think that you could overstate the impact of this play. How does it feel to kiss your own gender? A lot of these kids, they probably haven't heard people their own age say that they were gay. So I think that alone is going to stick with a lot of these students forever. I'm going to get my swag on with you. Yes! Welcome! I'm trying to make a difference for other people, whether you're gay or bi or transgender or have autism. You still are a human being, and you have the rights to love yourself and do what you want to do, what your heart desires. Oh, they're so great. Okay, so uh, where are we? Here we are. Okay, so <clears throat> the start of the theater health study 
uh, really begins with my personal love of assessment and evaluation. And it's not just for the purposes of gathering quantitative and qualitative data or to respond to the increase of reporting requirements by funders, and oh boy, are they increasing. I love it because it provides an opportunity for youth and teaching artists and community to formally review your programming. It provides concrete measures to improve programming, and it helps build better relationships. So this is from Evaluation in the Sacred Bundle. Measure what you value, and others will value what you measure. So arts organizations, oh boy, where's my cursor? Lots of tech problems today. Arts organizations and nonprofits are very challenged to name what they value. When we don't name what we value, there is little room for staff and community to celebrate successes and less clarity around challenges that need to be addressed for program improvement. So for close to a decade, I think most, particularly small arts organizations, would confess that they were only evaluating programs to comply with funder demands. And they are increasing. So uh, this... Uh, is a required attachment for a $50,000 grant. I almost passed out when I saw it. So the level of data collection required for this form is hundreds of hours of work. It excludes the trans community completely and is simply impossible in some cases. How can smaller organizations possibly compete for these funds without making things up or just flat out lying? This is another workshop that, or speech I would give, which is measuring up a, funder, a funder's intervention. <laughs> so for an arts organization, collecting the data is just many, many hours away from the very work that impacts the lives of young people we work with. However, a lot of organizations start here when it comes to assessment. They have a document to fill out for a funder, and they start collecting information to report out. So luckily, I had an amazing mentor at the Massachusetts Cultural Council, H. Mark Smith, who nearly 20 years ago helped me understand the value of evaluation and assessment in order to create better programs for your community. And this is actually where we started. So this is a logic model. This is the logic behind your program. And in 2003, this was the logic mod model that I started with. So how things are, your program as an intervention, the change that will come out of your program, and a new world order. So a logic model is a way of telling your story. This, sadly, is now my logic model favorite. So after several years, this became my favorite form of logic model. And this is our recent draft, updated drafts, but you get the idea. So it has clearly defined program. There's programming linked to positive outcomes. It provides language to development staff. And it's a one-pager for new program staff and contractors as well as funders. Now, I wish I could say through all of this, love of evaluation and assessment that I didn't have an ulterior motive for my love of it, but I did. So for several years, around the early 2000s, we had been fighting for every single dime that we received at the theater offensive, and we were reje being rejected by the exact same funders who were fully funding our colleagues. The difference? We were working with queer and trans youth. So I really got into evaluation and assessment because I could, I, uh, oh, no, go back, go back. Because, uh, oh, for crying out loud. I really got into evaluation and assessment because I knew that we could prove that we were one of the strongest programs in the city and it was actually homophobia and transphobia were, that were the real barrier for our program. So by 2009, my obsession was noticed by several of our colleagues in Youth Arts in Boston, and our organization was asked to be the theater component for the Boston Youth Arts Evaluation Project. 
This was a group of organizations across discipline, music, dance, theater, visual art, and public art, who came together to develop a field-wide framework, a handbook, and a workbook, all accessible for free online for you to download. Um, a lot of these sibling organizations felt that they needed a bump in their funding and support for the next generation of youth and felt like contributing to this particular process would help shed light on these five programs and would lead to more funding. So here's some of the data that came out of the Youth Arts, Boston Youth Arts Evaluation Project, which we call BIAP for short. Uh, and uh, so this is the We Connect, so connecting co to community. So 100% of youth agreed or strongly agreed that they've gained trusting relationships with staff here. 96% said, I believe that what I create positively impacts others. And then the quote, at True Colors, I have learned what it's like to be a leader. I have learned what it's like to have a family. I have learned what it's like to change lives. So the data that we collected was both quantitative and qualitative data, and we were so excited because after we published the book, we got a group of funders together, to, uh, and we wanted to find out what the next funding steps might be for this particular project. And most of the funders were impressed with our efforts, though there conveniently was no money available for us to continue the project. But there was one person, one person in that group that was not impressed at all. In fact, he insisted that internal evaluation would never prove effectiveness of programs to funders because the data could be skewed by all parties. So a young person wouldn't be honest because it might get their teacher in trouble. He advised us to engage with professional researchers. <laughs> what? Three years we worked on the Boston Youth Arts Evaluation Project. Three years thinking that this would come to something in the end. And oh boy, it didn't. So this is when my antenna went up to see if we could find a professional researcher to help us and to take our tools to the next level. So enter Gerald. Oh my God, this man is so amazing. So in a chance meeting that Abe, our founding director, and I had, we met him. And he's... He, at the time, was assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, his research focused on LGBTQ youth. Perfect. And he also was wanting to engage in a community-based approach. So we talked to him about True Colors and this current challenge set before us by the funders. And he told us that there was funding called c -Corps, um, in Boston dedicated to connecting Boston Children's Hospital researchers with community organizations. And so we jumped at the opportunity to work together. So what we know is that there's growing literature that uh, youth who ident self-identify as LGBTQ are at a disproportionate risk for a range of adverse physical health and mental health outcomes. This risk is not due uh, to these identities in and of themselves, but to exposure to social contexts that directly or indirectly stigmatize these identities, victimize youth who have these identities, or that perpetuate inequalities, power, resources, access to care, that underlies these health disparities. So in True Colors, we knew this firsthand from the youth. But Gerald said that there was very little known about evidence-based programs or treatment that can protect LGBTQ youth and enable resistance or promote health. So we felt like we were onto something. So we took the idea of researching True Colors Effect to the Leadership and Inclusion Council, our youth council. And many, many ideas for what the research could be about came up from the young people. But the conversation seemed to hone in on the effect True Colors had on depression and self-esteem in the members of the group. And in the end, the LIC voted to proceed with the research with stipulations. The first is that youth needed to be added to the research team. And that any youth in True Colors that did not want to participate, of course, should not be forced to do so. So as we put together our application for the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, I began to learn why research in our programs is so challenging. There are some competing needs. So 
we know that the needs of the population are on one side, the program priorities, what you set as priorities on the other, satisfying what the stakeholders, so the people who've paid you to do this project, and then the goals of the researchers. They're all at odds with one another. So also, we can't ignore the fact that medical and academic mistrust that exists in the community are very well documented, being referred to as subjects, history of flagrant abuses, the pl placebo versus treatment and the ethicalness of that, and then no direct benefits for a community. So this, there's this one approach called community-based participatory research. And what are the principles here? So communities are sometimes aware of the issues that are pressing, sometimes they don't know the magnitude, and sometimes they're not sure how to proceed. So CBPR engages community in the process of discovery, empowerment, and positive change. So the approaches are, it builds on strengths and resources in the community, it's a collaborative partnership at all stages of research. Search. It integrates knowledge and action, promotes co-learning and empowerment. It's uh, cyclical and iterative. It addresses health from positive perspectives. It disseminates findings and knowledge gained to all of the partners. So our research question then was, does True Colors contribute positively to mental health and self-esteem. That's what we came down to, this basic question. So our research goals were to do a longitudinal study through surveys and collection of qualitative data through interviews to develop a model of how True Colors influence depression and self-esteem processes, and then identifying the next steps. So now we get Gerald. He's gonna have a talk with us, so let's hear from him about the methods used in the theater health study. Cursor keeps disappearing. Here you are, girl. Yes. Okay. All right. So, how did we study um, the theater health study? How did we actually evaluate it? Um, well, first, in talking to Evelyn, Abe, and Nick, um, doing some observations of the True Colors program, and also in reading the Boston Youth Arts Evaluation Program report, um, it was clear that there was a model of development and resilience. Um, but the real question was, um, you know, is the program having its intended effect? Is it working? And not only that, but um, how do we know that it's working and what's contributing to its success? Um, and it's tricky um, in a program of its size, um, given that small, um, although it's steady, um, they consistently had the same number of youth coming in um, each season. Um, in research, um, you typically need large numbers um, of individuals in a program um, in order to test an effect. However, um, what we could do um, in a small group um, is use mixed methods. So um, provide surveys to the young people um, and also interview them to understand um, their sense of the process. Um, and that's what we did. Um, because we were interested in seeing um, how program involvement and involvement in True Colors um, impacts um, mental health and self-esteem. Um, we used high quality measures in the field for depression and self-esteem to see um, where the youth were at in terms of their depression and self-esteem. Um, but we were also interested in the story, how this program is fitting in in the youth's lives, um, the experiences they're having, and the meaning of those experiences. Um, and we leaned a lot more heavily on the qualitative data. So these one-on-one -on -one interviews that we did with the youth um, to sort of extract the overall picture. So we also interviewed youth to understand their motivations for doing True Colors, um, how the day-to-day -day of the program fits into their lives. Um, and in addition, because we wanted to see, you know, whether it's the True Colors program that's having an impact on LGBTQ IA youth's lives or um, just theater in general, um, we also tried to find an approximate comparison group of youth who um, identify as LGBTQIA um, who are also involved in a theater type experience, um, but who might be experiencing a different type of theater program. Um, so, you know, the hallmark of True Colors is that youth are taking experiences from their own lives and using that to generate original theater content. 
you know, they're telling stories from their own lives um, to make an impact on an audience. Um, other theater models might take existing content, like a script or a play, and perform that. Still very important, still a great way to be creative and express yourself. Um, but we wanted to get a contrasting experience of LGBTQIA youth um, who are also involved in theater. So we had to do our work and see, is there another group of youth who are LGBTQ identified who are also theater involved in Boston? And see if we can compare their experiences using the same methods, surveys, interviews, and see how those youth are doing and compare them to the True Colors youth, just to get that contrasting experience. So these are mixed methods approaches, um, but they help to capture the story and get convergence across different types of data. So just a little bit about the implementation. You heard a little bit of it, but just so you know what we did. So we did about six months of prep time together going through the LIC, having discussions with staff, and also getting IRB approval and just some training on research. So the study happened over the course of one year in True Colors. There are three different uh, sessions that we did, the summer, the fall, and the spring. And uh, we had to find a comparison group to study. Um, and the comparison group was conducted um, by youth. The, that research was, the, there were youth facilitators who were chosen uh, as researchers for that comparison group. And that comparison group, uh, Gerald mentioned was a school group, but it was an out of school time program uh, that was a theater program. So uh, then we analyzed the data after each session and then we came out with the final report. So here's a little <laughs> of the final report. It's probably too far away for you to see it, but um, uh, Gerald's going to talk about the results from his perspective, uh, and I just wanted to make sure you all got a visual here. And um, the things that I feel most drawn to, which of course I'm a storyteller, uh, are the narratives. And so there are two quotes here that I just want to read out. So the one in the green bubble. Yeah, I think True Colors definitely helped me with my depression because I joined after I graduated, so I was still going through that whole phase of depression. But I think just having that, the whole theater experience and being able to do what I loved definitely brought me out of that. And then this pink bubble down here, I think it's had an effect on my self-esteem, the way I see myself. Just because I don't know, I feel like it's just like it's given me so much confidence in who I am, growing into the person that I am. I wasn't this person two years ago or even a year ago when I joined, but I just think all the confidence it's given me has really helped my self-esteem. So the conclusions of our research were that first, many, many youth reported uh, depressive symptoms, low self-esteem, and low adult support at home, which was a, one of the things that we wanted to find out during BIAP was what are connections to other adult support. And the True Colors program provides a creative art space that empowers youth to thrive in positive ways, that helps them develop healthy coping skills, grow as individuals with healthier self-esteem, and learn new skills that can be applied to their daily lives. True Colors has the potential to provide the adult support the youth are lacking in their households, and is uniquely positioned to connect youth to mental health resources and additional support. So let's hear a little bit from Gerald again about um, the findings. And I put the Cliff's Notes version there on the side if you haven't figured that out. Um, so that you can follow along. Um, so there are very, several key takeaway points um, from the theater health study. Um, it's important to first bear in mind that, um, to put all these findings into context, um, so much of the research um, in public health and psychology um, on LGBTQIA youth is focused um, specifically on the health outcomes. Um, and usually on the ways in which LGBTQIA youth are not faring as well as um, their heterosexual or cisgender peers. Um, there's very little work done on resilience, um, how they're thriving, um, or research that's actually evaluating programs that support their healthy development, success, and thriving. Um, so already, just focusing on um, the True Colors program and evaluating it and seeing what works and what doesn't work about it is already a contribution. Um, so the key findings. 
Um, so first, although we found that um, many youth in the True Colors program um, met the cutoff for probable male depression, um, and that these scores were stable um, across their involvement in the study, um, we also found that the youth reported very high self-esteem. Okay. So this finding was somewhat surprising um, to all of us, that so many of the youth reported um, high depression scores or high depressive symptom scores. Um, but also surprising was that despite you know, these high depressive symptom scores, um, so many of the youth reported high self-esteem. So there's, they're very different outcomes, um, but they're opposite sides of the story. So youth felt very positively about themselves despite, you know, um, experiencing um, uh, depressive distress. Um, where youth in the True Colors program reported having, um, you know, few supportive adults um, in the house, um, which is again consistent with um, prior studies on LGBTQIA youth who often face um, rejection in multiple contexts, again, a lot of times based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, we found that youth who were involved um, in this program appeared to report um, a greater number of adults um, who provided encouragement, who supported them when they had problems or were experiencing problems, or when they were feeling upset. So it appears that being involved in um, community programs um, such as True Colors um, just increases the number of supportive adults um, that could be in a young person's life. Um, and there's a growing literature um, that uh, demonstrates that having, you know, additional supports, particularly um, these other adult supports who aren't necessarily your parents, can have such a beneficial impact on young people's lives. Um, we found that the youth in True Colors, in comparison to um, LGBTQIA youth who were in this comparison group, you know, I mentioned this earlier, um, we found LGBTQIA youth who were also involved in a theater program in a school-based setting. Um, what we found is that the youth in the True Colors program were generally dealing with more depressive symptoms and daily stressors um, than youth in that comparison sample. Okay. Now, the youth in the comparison sample had lower depressive symptom scores and also generally high self-esteem. Okay. So, in comparing the two groups, what we can see is that um, perhaps the youth who are in this community sample, you know, in the True Color sample, um, might be dealing with a lot more, which makes the impact of this community program um, that much greater, okay? That much more necessary. Um, they might need this program a little bit more because um, they might be um, dealing with greater stressors. And so the benefits of this program might go a lot longer for youth um, who might have greater need. Where the data really came alive were in the interviews. Um, so although it was clear that the program um, was not a replacement for therapy, okay, so the youth said, for example, that um, they were seeing therapists on the side or that they had a counselor on the side. Um, and we want to be very clear that, you know, um, this arts program um, shouldn't be a replacement for therapy. You know, there is arts therapy, okay? Um, and that's entirely different. Um, the True Colors program um, and other arts programs that might be similar um, appear to provide a space for the young people to thrive. Um, as one person um, in the study mentioned, it was a space for them to come out from under the water. Such a beautiful metaphor. Okay. Um, and it was specifically that combination of being a theater space for artistic expression, as well as being a safe space um, to be gay, queer, trans, or however the young people identify, um, that creates that freedom to be creative and to grow. Um, so if youth are depressed, um, the depression doesn't appear to get worse in this space. Um, and if youth are um, dealing with low self-esteem, the self-esteem grows, gets better, or it stays high. Now, of course, this is just one program, and we only observed it across um, one year of programming, so three seasons, so more research is needed. You know, you take a risk in doing evaluation. Um, it can show the ways in which your program is helping, and also the ways in which the program might be maintaining or maybe falling short of what you thought your program was doing. Um, in this case, um, what the evaluation showed is wow, this program really is providing a space for the youth to thrive, um, and in some cases survive um, a lot of the stressors that they're dealing with. Um, and um, from a youth development perspective, you know, these are artists, artists who are dedicated in youth development, these um, adult mentors, 
And what they're finding is that, look, this is as far as we can go um, as directors in this program, but what more can we do to make sure that the youth who are um, coming to our program are getting the help that they need? You know, we're not going to be mental health counselors, um, but what we could do is maybe partner with other organizations um, in our community to make sure that the youth who are coming here for an arts program are getting wraparound care. Okay. Um, and as a researcher, um, I love working um, with these programs because um, you know, all of us are invested in making sure that um, you know, LGBTQIA adolescents um, are thriving. Um, and you know, thriving is not just the absence of depression, it's um, you know, full maximal expression um, of their creative selves. So I wanted to read the full quote uh, that Gerald mentioned about being underwater from a young person. So this is Mark. Um, I felt depressed because I felt like I couldn't really be who I wanted to be. I knew who I wanted to be inside, but I was like, I can't be because she's going to say something or he's going to put his nose up at me. But something happened when I was in True Colors that just opened my understanding and just brought me out. Like, it was like I was underwater. And coming to True Colors, I got out of the water for some reason. It's like, wow, okay, I can do this. I don't need to hide no more. Why was I hiding? There's a quote here too that talk, speaks to the mental health challenges. And this is another participant that indicated that he had clinical depression. But in this particular case, his suicidality uh, may not have reflected suicidal ideation measures, but rather his understanding of how he was being treated by his foster parents who re rejected him for being gay. In his words, Jaden indicated, if I died, no one would care because at the time, that's the action I was receiving. This quote really underscores the um, cons uh, and consistently high level of rejection some of the youth in True Colors endured while growing up or still endure. However, it's important to note that some of the youth also reported being very supported by a family member. And then in addition, and perhaps no surprise to all of you, one participant described theater as being a major release. Uh, Mika says that the ritual and practice of learning the lines provides comfort and release. She also indicates that rehearsal can allow her to process those feelings uh, that she wasn't initially aware of. So theater may be structured and safe space to feel and express emotions. In this sense, it could be a powerful tool to allow youth to process negative experiences, develop insight, and find healing. And I love the, the last part of this uh, quote from Mika. And I think it helps because if I hadn't released in class, I probably would have brought it home and it just exploded. So post-research, so given this research, we've considered some more extreme responses like hiring a social worker on staff. But we think that this would change the fundamental purpose of True Colors, which youth have already said complements their current mental health care. So here's how we shored up and, or improved our program. So first on, first on the list is the check-in process. So that is immovable. That is something that we will do with every single program is a check-in process. It's a moment for young people to say what's going on in their lives, for a group of adults to shut up and hear what's going on their in their lives and try to uh, do something about it. So, uh, we have after uh, rehearsal check-ins with young people or break check-ins with young people to see how they're doing and if they need additional supports. And so if they do need additional supports, there are referrals that we offer. So the great thing about Boston is that there are lots of organizations that specifically serve LGBTQ youth. We have a health clinic that's dedicated to LGBTQ youth called the Sydney Borum Health Center. And uh, there are other uh, sibling organizations like the Boston Alliance for LGBTQ Youth that they have a clinician on staff and they have a social worker on staff. So I will physically walk a young person over so that I can say, I am someone you trust, this is someone I trust, and that, inter that 
introduction happens live and in person instead of just handing a piece of paper and crossing their finger, my fingers that they'll actually go to seek the services. So um, all of our youth workers will do that act of walking someone to the services that they need. The last part of this is that we create a community resource guide for all of our staff. So what we realized is that adult support is, ex is essential, and it can't just be the youth workers because young people are interacting with all of the staff. And so we created a community resource guide. In a pinch, if a youth worker could not be accessed at a particular time, then uh, a staff person could go to this community resource guide that's on a shelf and electronic and find the resource that a young person would need. Of course, we as youth workers are always try to be accessible. It might be one in the morning, yes, youth work. Uh, but uh, to make sure that we're available to young people at all times. And then finally, what we realized is that a lot of this research supported what we learned in BIAP. So that funder who said, go and get yourself a professional research, ha ha, we got the professional research and the researcher upheld what we learned in BIAP. So we were really happy about that. So again, the takeaways. So, if we hadn't been doing evaluation and assessment, I think I would have been terrified to work with the researcher. I kind of knew what the community was going through, but didn't know for certain. And so, uh, again, this is an iterative process. There's a place to start. Don't feel like you have to jump right in to working with a researcher. Um, Program imp improvement is the most important. Don't just be guided by what the funders are asking you to do. Program improvement is the most important in this process. Um, also, the community-based participatory research, uh, it helps maintain our values when we're working with researchers. That's so important. Um, be specific, so, mm -mm, go back, mama, go back. Uh, so, engaging with, uh, uh, so be specific, so when engaging in this research, be sure that you're finding that specific question. Come on, where are you? Center, well, I'll just go off the cuff, here we go, let's hope this isn't 20 minutes. Um, center design justice, so again, making sure that young people are the ones who are saying uh, what they need and shaping that research. It's really important and should be prioritized in all of your programs, all of your programs. We learned that uh, theater does, in fact, have a deep impact on LGBTQ youth and in their lives. And finally, don't forget, research is part of a bigger picture and should not, research should not dictate what you're doing with programs, but it should complement it. So that's it. Thank you so much for listening. So um, we do have a few minutes for questions. If folks, questions, comments, queries. <laughs> yes. The one individual who was objecting to that initial research project, mm -hmm. did he change his mind? Mm -mm. Oh. Mm -mm. No, and that's why I emphasize, don't do this for the funders, do it for your own program improvement. Because the funders, they, I mean, they have their job to do, which is to put other hoops out for us, right? Now that all of us have, you know, decided that evaluation is important and we're stretching ourselves to the limits, they've just put the goalpost a little bit further, right? Which is the way that it works. Uh, other than centering uh, youth voices in the research process, can you talk about other ways that you uh, center design justice and um, any other resources or things that you drew on um, in regards to design justice specifically? Yeah, well, I think uh, the, for a very long time, about 10 years, Mark H. Smith, or H. Mark Smith, who I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of his work was about design justice. If young people are not um, designing alongside you, then you're working in a bubble, 
right? And that the young people vote with their feet, meaning your room is empty for rehearsal for a reason. Um, and uh, so that was instilled, that, like that put the fear of God into me really at the very beginning of my career. I really heard that. And so um, for us, you know, when we first started, I, my first uh, True Colors troupe that I directed in 2001, there were four young people in it. And uh, there was a way in which one young person was saying, I'd like to do more. And so I said, okay, what do you want to do? And she said, well, what if I were to stage manage? And so we spent time in the office and I was teaching her how to do stage management. And then uh, another person said, well, I want to run sound, right? So year after year after year, it was a matter of saying yes. When young people want to do something, they're telling you what they want to do, and it's your job to listen in these moments. And so in terms of that's kind of baked into the DNA in Boston, we have a, an amazing training the, um, from the BEST initiative. And uh, it's a youth worker training. They might have an online resource. I'll have to check in with, all, uh, with that and let you all know. But um, it's a youth worker training. And it's to legitimize the field of youth work. Because 10, 15 years ago, people were like, oh, you just run an after school program. Well, that's nothing. Um, and it was saying, we want to create the structure and backbone so that youth are at the center of all of our work. And, um, so that's, that's a big resource that we've pulled from. And again, I think design justice is baked into really solidly good youth work. Other things? Questions? Yeah, Faye. I really um, just wanted to say I appreciate uplifting the the um, the point of not replacing therapy. Can you talk a little bit uh, um, more about how you juggled that feeling of um, focusing in on your core competency as far as like the theater work versus the decision to not have a social worker on staff? So it's something we still grapple with. I mean, every year it's like, ooh. Uh, what, what's going on, right? The resources are dwindling in most communities. What resources youth have access to at those centers that I uh, told you about, you know, one social worker is working with 32 young people. Um, it's an intense prospect for that one social worker at Bagley. And, um, and they had to take a leave of absence for three months. So then they had to shuffle young people to other uh, other social workers in the meantime, which is an, just an impossible task. So I think we still are wrestling with what, what should we be doing here. Some of it is just financial strain, right? We can't pay a social worker what they should be paid. And I think a lot of arts organizations would say that. The other thing is we can't provide the supports. We don't have the expertise to provide the supports for a social worker. So to pretend that we are an office that would support a social worker, we would be lying to ourselves. And it would be to the detriment of the young people, which no one wants to walk into that, where it's detrimental to the young people and to the social worker. So I do think we still wrestle with it every single year. Um, we have uh, an increased need that's happening. I think our political climate is bringing things to a crisis, but it's always been a crisis for LGBTQ youth. And so, um, it, it feels uh, uh, like it's every single day, and it's not just family members that are doing this. It's the whole, you turn off on the TV and you can't get away from the oppressive nature of our world. So, um, yeah, it's something we still, we still wrestle with. I'll let you know if we make a change, if we flip that coin. All right, I would like to have you all please join me in thanking Evelyn. This is wonderful. Thank you. I just needed to bring my wife for technical assistance. Remind me to do that next time. Remind me to do that. Amazing research and a great setup for our day because you've touched on all the points that we're going to be going deeper into uh, any minute now. So um, I'm going to have us move right into our next plenary panel. But before that, I have a housekeeping announcement. 
For those of you who've been aching to find out the Wi-Fi